So I was watching Joel Osteen. And it ended with this, and granted, I turned it on at the end. It ended with this. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you the Lord of my life. <clears throat> and Joel went on to say in his very uplifting voice, friend, if you prayed that prayer, we believe you got born again. Get in a good Bible-based church. Keep God first place. He's going to take you places you never dreamed of. And I started thinking, about milk because therefore let us leave the elementary doctrine of Messiah go on to maturity not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God that is the milk that the author of Hebrews tells us we should know and really as I listened to what Joel had said I thought to myself well man He's, he's really taking it seriously. Like, let us leave the elementary stuff behind. What he's saying here is repentance. I repent of my sins. Okay, check. I said that in that statement. I make you the Lord of my life. So I guess technically we could say that's faith toward God. So, so, so Joel's sinner's prayer is really kind of moving them right through the elementary principles. But then I thought, a little bit more. And I thought, would Yeshua sign off on that? Would, would any of the disciples sign off on that? Now, maybe, maybe it's possible because, as I said, I didn't see the whole message. Maybe it's possible that, that Joel had just delivered one of those Peter-esque acts to you got to come to God and lay your life before him. And we're all 3,000 got saved. Maybe he had given that message. I don't know. And, and it was just absolutely power packed. But, but, but I, I don't know. What I think Joel was saying is what his website says. The scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved if you would like to know Christ, all you have to do is receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ by saying a prayer of salvation. Now that's Romans 10. No, actually, that's not Romans. It's Joel, but it's in Romans. And, and, and that seems to make Joel's case pretty clearly. I mean, what it says is, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So that's Romans 10. Now, Apart from the fact that Romans 10 falls right in between Romans 9 and Romans 11, which is some of Paul's most detailed, uh, hard to understand, really in, requires some real chewing through that, re regardless of the fact that you really need to read the whole thing in context for it to make sense, and also realize that it has never stopped. Context has never slowed anyone down. Do you know that? <laughs> Context is sometimes, oftentimes, completely irrelevant. If I can find one verse that supports it, that's going to work for me. And I sort of think maybe that's a little bit of, of what's going on here. But here's the question. If it's really that easy, if it's that easy, what are we doing here? Why are we even wasting our time to be studying through anything? I mean, what about this, this whole series? Do we really need this? Clearly, that is as elementary as it gets, right? I mean, do we need more detail? Who needs to read anything? But, but then I ask myself, I'm sorry, I can't help it. I'm arguing with myself. What about the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say? What about the gospel? What about obedience? What about counting the cost? What about making disciples? What about the kingdom? What about living for God? What about some of those difficult scriptures that Paul quotes where he says, if you do this, you're not going to go into the kingdom of God. What about some of those things? I guess the truth is maybe I just missed it because I guess I was reading contextually, bad boy. 
Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Believe. Believe. Here's the, this is the pivotal word. Believe. A 30-second prayer at the end of a Joel Osteen series where I believe in Jesus. They believe that now I'm saved. And the truth is, friends, we spent the last two weeks really talking about that about how it starts, repentance and all those kinds of things. And, 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 and it certainly looks to me, even though Paul made that statement in, in Romans 10, 9, and even if we want to take it just on its own, regardless of the rest of the verses around it, it seems to me, I could be wrong, that Yeshua seemed to put a little more weight on it than that. That more than a magic formula or, quote, a belief or an assent to some me mental idea, I, I, it, it seems more to me. And maybe even more difficult to believe, honestly, maybe more difficult to believe than that's all it takes is that someone who doesn't utter those words is destined for eternal torment and damnation in the flames of hell. That also is hard to believe. So I'm struggling with my belief after watching Joel. I need to send him an email. But maybe there's a reason that the second elementary principle doesn't actually say repentance from dead works and believe in Jesus. It actually doesn't even say, believe in God. It says, repentance from dead works and faith toward God, or faith on God is actually what it says in the Greek. It doesn't say anything about belief. Now, we can get semantic and we can talk about Greek and say, well, that's one translation of it. But that's the whole point of today is to help you understand that it's more than a prayer. If this isn't obvious already, it's more than a prayer and it's more than belief. And that may sound very controversial. So let me jump right into that and get you settled down. The milk that we should not even have to talk about is faith toward God. Because, as I said, that is, I believe anyway, that that sounds a bit more involved than believing. After all, did you know that only one in ten Americans says that they do not believe in a higher power of some sort? Not necessarily the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but only one in ten American, uh, Americans do not believe in something greater. It's not hard to believe in something. It's really not. I mean, for goodness sakes, believing in our God is not hard. Here, how, how, some examples of people who believed in God or entities or forces that believe in God. Remember in James? We'll talk about it at the end. James says, you believe in God? Great. You know who else does? The demons. When, when, uh, when the spies went to Rahab, she was not, uh, she, she, well, eventually, but at this particular time is living in a culture of complete he heathens in Jericho. And what did they believe in? They were terrified of God our God, because he had, they had seen what he did. They believed in God. You know who else believed in God? Egypt believed in God. Here's, by the way, what they said in, uh, in, for Rahab. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. No, that's not it. When we heard these reports, our hearts melted and no courage remained in anyone any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth below. She believed, and Egypt believed in God. And this is where we need to stop, collect our thoughts. We get an opportunity now to move into the Torah because when we do these New Testament series, apostolic gospel series, we're missing so much of what's going on in the Torah every week. And last week we started 
a huge book in the Torah, Exodus, Shemot, which means names. That's the Hebrew name. We started that last week, and now we're making our way through it. And we're seeing the plagues and Moses and Pharaoh and all this other kind of stuff. So the timing is perfect for us to jump back in to the Torah to make this point and understand a little bit more about belief. Exodus 14, 31, we have two translations. Israel saw the great power that, and this is where I'm actually jumping ahead. We haven't gotten to this in the Torah yet. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. That's the ESV translation and there are a lot of other translations like that. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is Israel. Here's the art scroll, the Hebrew translation of the same verse. And when Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, the people for feared the Lord, and they had faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And the question is, what's the difference? Believe, have faith, it's all the same. You're gonna really make me listen to this for 30 minutes? It's a big difference, actually. And the word believe in or have faith in, properly phrased, Vaya minu in Hebrew, that root word is from aman. Do you know where we might get a similar word that might sound like aman? If you've ever been in any Pentecostal church and the pastor has said something good, you know the word I'm talking about. Amen, brother! That's where the word comes from. Aman. Amen means an, a, 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 an absolute agreement an support confirmed to be faithful, to be established, to be carried, make firm, stand firm, to trust, to be certain, and last but not least, to believe in. So we should possibly say either translation works, right? Believe in, faith in, no, not really, and here's why. These are not the same thing. Egypt absolutely believed in God. How could they not? How could they not after what they saw? This is the purpose of why God did some of the things that he did. The Egyptians will know, know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. God was doing all of these things to reveal himself to Egypt and to Israel. Exodus 10, and that you may recount in the hearing of your sons and your sons' sons how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I displayed my signs among them, in order that you may know that I am the Lord. Vidatem, the root word, yada, to know. God is committed to making sure he is known. Now that's a bit confusing. What is it to know somebody? Dave, are you able to stand up real quick? Perfect. This is Dave. I believe in Dave because I can see Dave right there. I know that Dave is here and in the room. I believe in him. That is very different than me having faith in Dave. And the only way that I can have faith in Dave is to know Dave. Because when I look and believe that his existence and form is here and that he's waving his hand or walking around, that does not communicate to me in any way that Dave is a man of integrity, that Dave is a man who can be trusted, that Dave is a man who loves God, that Dave has the unfortunate, unfortunate abominable trait of being an Alabama fan. I mean, these are things that unless you know Dave, you, you can't know. And I cannot have faith in Dave given the fact that he exists. I must know him. To know God is not to believe in his existence. Do you believe in God? Well, it, it, it doesn't really mean that. Uh, not, it's, it's not, I believe God exists. In terms of Egypt, 
and Israel. Do you think that either one of them struggled to believe that God was real, that he existed after what he had done through the plagues and the splitting of the sea and the death of the Egyptians on the seashore? Do you think there was any question in either side's mind as to whether or not God existed? They believed in God. But God's purpose for us is certainly not about believing that he exists. It's not, I believe that God is. Faith toward God is, I believe that God does. That's the difference. Now, in in other words, in other words, It's much more than a mental assent to the reality of God. Okay? Is that fair? Is that a a reasonable premise when we distinguish between faith and belief? It is a knowledge when you know what God does and who God is, who he is, that that impacts the way of life that you live, that he is active. Like my examples of Dave, when I know him, when I see him, I begin to to experience his attributes and I see that the things he said, he's true about. You know God to Israel as opposed to Egypt. However, God becomes something very different at this pivotal moment on the seashore. And this is, this is, He becomes known. It is more than a belief. It's more than an abstract thing. It's so vague, I believe in. This is so much more than that. He's moving, he's doing on their behalf, and they have observed it. He's doing, and they are to move toward him. They are to believe. Yes, of course, that's easy and that's obvious. But to have faith that he is trustworthy. But he's doing something more. He's revealing something to them as well. What they're seeing about him. They, he is revealing to them through all of these events at the Exodus that he desires a relationship with them. A relationship is not one way. A relationship is a partnership. And this one's very uneven because obviously God does the majority of the work. When Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they had faith in the Lord. That is to say, dedicating himself to to them. This phrase right here, Dalif Nemiata Omed. We, it's, it's over the ark. Why? Because as you stand up and as we do the barhu and we do all the things that we do and we take the Torah out, that, if you, if you speak Hebrew and now you'll know, means know before whom you stand. And that is what was revealed to Egypt and Israel. But Israel took it to heart. They believed in and knew God, even fearing him. Because an important part of our faith toward God as an elementary principle is that one of the things that God does, and you may not like this, and there's a lot of argument out there about sides in in churches. We don't talk enough about sin. We don't talk enough about, you you don't understand the cost of sin. Well, you know what? That's what Israel saw there. Israel saw that God does a lot of things. And one of those things is that he punishes the unrighteous and rewards the righteous. That is an attribute of God. And that is part of our faith realization in him, which results in the fear of God, which is part of our faith. It says they feared God and had faith in him. I love this wonderful quote from, again, from the Chumash commentary. This is, that the Jews saw God's great hand is mentioned only after they saw the dead Egyptians. 
But surely the splitting of the sea should have been enough for them to recognize his greatness. If the Egyptians had emerged from the sea alive, the miracle would have seemed for no purpose, actually, because after the ten plagues, there was no need for God to prove that he controlled nature. In other words, he had already done everything he could possibly do to establish belief in himself. He was real. He didn't need to do anything else to prove that. It was only when the same miracle that saved the righteous, Israel, simultaneously punished the wicked that the Jews recognized a new dimension of God's greatness. If they had faith in him, if they, if they believed that he was capable of doing all he said, that meant that they live in obedience to him. They were a part of the plan, and with that came responsibility. They were called to intentional relationship with God. He had done his part. He had demonstrated his faith in action. And now we need to act as if we trust him. It's called kingdom living. Yeshua talked a lot about it. It's living righteously as a result of our faith in what God does. And faith in or toward God should move us toward more than believing in the existence of something, or to only being thankful for what God does for us, or for getting us to heaven. It's also about what we do for Him. And so we move now to the more difficult of scriptures to close here. Difficult only in this sense, that it seems to conflict with so many people's idea of faith and getting saved, and believing in Jesus. But it seems to jive quite clearly with what we're saying here, and this is this. James 2, one of Martin Luther's favorite scriptures. <laughs> Not. Because justification by faith, which we'll talk about another time, was his gig, and there's something to be said. But here's what James, the brother of Yeshua, said. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? There we go, man. Works. What is it about this synagogue? You're always talking about works. Can that faith save him? Really chew on what is being said right here. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without my works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. Here's the scripture we started with. You do well. It's very sarcastic. You do well. Good for you. The demons believe that too, silly. And they shudder. They're fearful of that. But you, willing to recognize, you foolish fellow... That faith without works is useless. I've had a little bit of a struggle in this message, this whole series. Because my intention is not to like back everyone into a corner. First of all, not to attack every church that's ever talked anything about justification by faith or salvation or the wrong gospel message or any of those things. I'm not out to be adversarial. I'm not out to be legalistic and to put you under the law. Oh, oh man. Under the law. That's not the point. I'm not trying to push you somewhere. I'm trying to clarify, and I don't want to confuse anyone along the way. But what James is saying, this is the fullness of faith. 
This is the implementation of the full gospel as James heard it from his very own brother, Yeshua, who said things like, live for the kingdom, do this, do that, do this, do that. You were created for good works, actually it says. It is what faith toward God truly looks like. It's more than a statement. It's more than a 15 second prayer. It's more than an assent. It is elementary. So back to Joel Osteen. I'm pretty sure that when Paul says in Romans 10, the word of faith we are proclaiming, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I think, I think, I believe that he's saying a little bit more than the sinner's prayer. I don't even think Paul would be able to comprehend the idea that we teach people that that's what discipleship in Yeshua is, or that's what that means. Paul thought Jewishly, not Greekly. So when he says, believe in your heart, it means what the seashore belief meant. It means that full faith God does. I'm moving toward God because I believe that he does these things, that he is faithful to do these things. And what he's going to do is so much bigger than just save little old me. And I know I picked an easy target in Joel Osteen, and I am, I mean, no, no one claims Joel Osteen. I feel sorry for the guy. He's, he's obviously had an impact. I'm not being critical of Joel. I'm being critical of an idea that, that I heard from Joel. The idea of making the statement, of, of just saying the words, that is not faith toward God. I'm not in that plan. That's just something I said on a whim. I'm not in that. That is not relationship. That is not faith. That is not belief in or faith toward. Acknowledging God is easy to do. The demons do it, you foolish person. We've talked so much about what being a disciple of Messiah meant, living with faith toward God, gospel, kingdom, redemption. Most of all, living as if you believed that that was actually going to happen. And, 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 and I don't know that a lot of people understand that full gospel plan that we've talked about. But here's a great quote from Scott McKnight in this new vision for Israel. It is unhistorical to see faith merely as some private sense of trust in God for personal redemption. That's, that's pretty deep. Faith for Jesus meant what it did for Israel's prophets. Confidence in God's word to the nation. Ushering in the fortunes of Israel and hope that his promises would soon materialize. That's the faith that Paul was talking about, and that's the faith that the entire Gospels and Apostolic Scriptures are talking about. But what's elementary principle of Messiah-ish about that? Here's the question. All of Israel believe those things. All of Israel believed that about God. They had faith that God was going to do those things. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Et well, not the Sadducees, they're their, own, they're their own world. The Essenes. Judaism believed those things. And so what's the point? Our faith toward God was exemplified and made possible one way. One way. And I need one more week to conclude it. Because it relies on this statement, which takes us right back to Exodus 14.31. And next week we'll make the connection. 
They had faith in God and in his servant Moses. Fast forward, John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And that's where we're going to conclude faith as an elementary principle next week. Let's stand together. Oh, Shabbat Shalom. Forgot that part. <laughs>